Let's consider chapter 15, our chapter on the mental disorders, also called psychological disorders or psychological illnesses. This is a particularly valuable chapter because I can't imagine a person in this class not being personally touched by a mental disorder. You might suffer from a depression condition, anxiety condition, uh, bulimia, so many different conditions, or a family member might have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, uh, alcoholism. Uh, you get the idea. It's impossible to live without being touched with these disorders. So it's a great idea to have a basic knowledge of some of the most common disorders, other causes, and in the next chapter we'll consider treatments because virtually every disorder is very treatable. Unfortunately, so many people see it as a sign of personal failing, and which it is not, and they don't reach out for help. And generally, most disorders tend not to go away on their own. So with this understanding, we'll be able to help ourselves and other people and hopefully live a much more satisfying and productive life. So let's start now. What broad term should we use for these disorders? In the previous slide, I used psychological disorder, and that's a fully acceptable term, but you could also call these illnesses psychological illnesses, mental disorders, and mental illnesses. These all are health conditions, and these health conditions can negatively impact how we, hmm, three blanks, what do you think? If you're thinking think, feel, and act, absolutely correct. Be careful though, not every three blank answer will be think, act, and feel. It might be it ego, super ego, or if you consider developmental psychology, it'd be looking at how we change physically, intellectually, and socio-emotionally. But here, the correct sequence is, in any order, think, feel, and act. How are these disorders diagnosed? Well, with a manual called the DSM, typically, DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Diagnostic, of course, referring to the word diagnosis. Statistical is a little bit of a toughie. When I ask students on tests, what does the S stand for, I get all sorts of options, uh, some of which I frankly like better than the word statistical. Uh, many students want to go with symptom. Don't go with that word. Go with statistical. As you can see, it's produced by the APA. Uh, many students would think, ah, American Psychological Association. No, the acronym APA is used by many organizations. In this case, the P is for psychiatric. Now, this is not the only man manual that's used. Another one that's as commonly used is produced by the World Health, sorry, World Health Organization, and they are very much compatible with each other. Let's jump into the different families of mental illness. We'll start with anxiety disorders. In this particular chapter, obviously, we won't have time to go through all the disorder classes, and not necessarily even every disorder found within a particular family, but we'll try to do a nice uh, representative sample, including most of the ones that are discussed in intro psych and maybe a few beyond that. So let's again consider anxiety disorders, starting with one called generalized anxiety disorder. If you suffer from this one, you're in a constant, continuous state of anxiety when you get up throughout the day, when you go to bed. I often ask my students, name some things that make you feel anxious. Common answers are public speaking, the way you feel before a test, uh, maybe driving on snowy roads. Well, I ask my students to imagine feeling that way that you feel in that circumstance most days, most of the day. It's very unpleasant, but thank goodness it is very treatable. Next, let's consider panic disorder. A person with panic disorder has an ongoing problem with panic attacks. If you have a panic attack then, do you have panic disorder? Not at all necessarily. For example, almost 40% of students will have a panic attack. Very few go on to actually have panic disorder. Invariably, many students in each class have already had a panic attack, so I ask the students to volunteer common symptoms. One common symptom is a racing heart. It often is confused with a heart attack. This is not to, uh, to say that if you have the symptoms of a heart attack, you should dismiss them. I share the example of a, from a Dr. G medical examiner in which a, a Vietnam vet had PTSD 
and he ended up on Dr. G Medical Examiner, which is a show about a coroner. It's never good to be featured on the show. And I asked my students to guess how this vet ended up on Dr. G. Well, he had not only PTSD, he had panic disorder. And he had not a panic attack, but a heart attack, but it felt the same to him. So he ignored the symptoms and he actually died of a heart attack. So again, if you're the heart attack age, don't necessarily dismiss symptoms that are heart attack-like. Be careful of diagnosing yourself with panic disorder if you're of heart attack age. But in any case, feeling like you're having a heart attack is one symptom. Rapid breathing. With that goes a feeling that you can't get enough air. With rapid breathing and feeling like you're not getting enough air would also be many times tingling of the body. It might be all sorts of visual symptoms related to this hyperventilation, blurred vision, tunnel vision, uh, black and white vision. Other symptoms include a feeling of sheer terror, a feeling like you're going to die, and many other symptoms as well. It's very intense, very strong. When it passes, the person feels exhausted, mentally exhausted, physically exhausted. Again, thank goodness it's treatable but you have to seek treatment to get it treated. Next, let's consider phobias. I'll define them for us as an intense and irrational fear. If it's not intense, it's not a phobia. If it's not irrational, it's not a phobia. Next, go to the subsequent slide on phobias, and when you're done, come back to this slide because we still have to talk about OCD and hoarding. So we just define phobia as an intense and irrational fear. It could be of an object or it could be of a situation. At this point in the course, I introduced the concept of stigma every year. In the past, virtually every mental disorder had heavy stigma. You wouldn't share with friends. Uh, you would ne not necessarily share with family. You certainly wouldn't share, share with your employer or your neighbors. Virtually all mental illnesses had heavy stigma. For example, in the past, if you had an intellectually uh, disabled child, you would have kept the child at home as much as possible, or maybe institutionalized the child for fear of embarrassment. Thank goodness we've changed. I'd like to talk about phobias because this mental illness has lost all or virtually all of its stigma, so students are comfortable sharing their phobias. If I asked you to share your phobia, would you have? Some of the common phobias that students share are heights, acrophobia, which you don't need to know the name, claustrophobia, tight clothes in places, you don't need that name either. Or look at the pictures on the slide. The snake, clowns, spiders, dogs, birds, needles, uh, blood, public speaking, and so on. There's also less usual ones. I'd say birds are probably a less usual one, but also could be things like lint or styrofoam. People with phobias can be a snob. My phobia, in other words, my intense and rational fear is reasonable, but yours is ridiculous. Please don't be a phobia snob. There's no difference between being afraid of needles and perhaps being afraid of lint. They're equally phobic. Let's consider one phobia by name, agoraphobia. Almost everybody with agoraphobia has panic attacks and they were untreated and it morphed into agoraphobia. This is not to say that most people with panic disorder will develop agoraphobia. Definitely not, but just about everybody with agoraphobia started with panic disorder, which they did not properly address. I was lucky enough to travel one year to Greece, and while in Greece, I went to an agora. An agora is a marketplace, so literally it comes from the Greek phrase, uh, fear the market. But it's not the marketplace per se, it's any place that you can't get out of easily and quickly, any place that is not considered safe by you, not within your safety zone. A person with a very light level might be able to go wherever they want, but it would be unpleasant and maybe given a choice between going out to a movie or ordering one in, they would choose to order in. A person with more severe agoraphobia maybe could not leave their neighborhood alone, that is. Severe yet, maybe they could only leave their neighborhood with a trusted friend, relative, or family member. At the most severe level, the person would become literally housebound. So definitely 
all mental disorders should be treated. Next, let's consider OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. We have to begin by distinguishing obsessions from compulsions. An obsession is a type of thought, whereas a compulsion is a type of behavior, but we have to add a more than that. So the obsession is a repeating thought that causes great anxiety. The compulsion then is the behavior that the person may feel compelled to do over and over. Why do they feel compelled to do the behavior? Well, while they're doing the behavior, it temporarily reduces, alleviates the anxiety. It's a short reprieve. So obsessive, the repeating thought, compulsion, the repeating behavior. Let's consider two examples. Probably the example that most people think of first is the obsession over germs, dirt, contamination, the behavior, excessive hand washing. That might actually be a healthy behavior for a short term in this environment, but long term, it is not. People with OCD might uh, have to get up repeatedly during a class because they have to wash their hands. A person might get fired from their job because they're always in the bathroom, again, washing their hands. A friend of the friend had a baby that was actually hospitalized because she kept washing the child's hands with the antibacterial soap and the child became very, very ill. Another obsession is to perform rituals. Well, let me rephrase that, to think about the rituals. The compulsion would be the performance of them. So obsession, the thought of the ritual, compulsion, the doing of it. For example, a person might have to flick a light switch five times when they enter a room. Obsessions often involve, this type involve numbers. Maybe you cannot live at an even number house or an odd number house. Maybe you can't have an odd number uh, channel listened to on your TV or you won't listen to an odd number radio station. Again, these are two of the categories of obsessions and compulsions. There are many more though. If you take abnormal psych, you'll hear of other categories as well. As you remember, hopefully from the earlier side, another category of anxiety disorder would be hoarding. This is a new category in the DSM. Hoarding uh, can be of objects. Sometimes they're objects of value, but can be also objects with no value, uh, rotten food, uh, newspaper, plastic bags, used cans, or even human excrement, believe it or not. I'm sure we've all seen those TV shows about hoarders and they're hard to resist watching for at least a few minutes. Sometimes the house is unsafe. If it ever caught fire, the person would definitely die and they would not be able to escape. Other times, the house actually has to be leveled because it is a public health menace. But let's consider the next slide, which is, I think, even more disturbing. Hoarding can be in objects, but hoarding can also be of living animals. Whenever you heard of a seizure on, say, the evening news, in which 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 animals are seized, this person is a hoarder. Many times these animals are in terrible shape, uh, sometimes found dead in their cages, uh, cages often full of excrement, inches or sadly these people uh, have a mental illness which they are imposing on other living beings. As a hint, it's in the family of anxiety and OCD related disorders. Make your guess, uh, the way they're dressed could be a possible hint. In trichotillomania, the person has an irresistible impulse to pull out their hair. It could be head, uh, eyelashes, or really any part of the body. Since it's related to OCD and the other anxiety disorders, it's often treated with the same therapy and the same medications. Let's now consider family disorders called the paraphilias. They're all unusual and often unacceptable sexual preferences. Let's start with zoophilia. Any guesses? If you're thinking, no, it can't, uh, yes, it can. This is people who sexually interact 
with animals. Necrophilia. Maybe you've heard the term necropolis. Necro refers to death, so necrophilia, they are aroused by death and dying. There are different levels of it, if you believe. A light level might be just a person imagines their partner is dead or a partner is dead. A more severe level, uh, maybe they will, since these partners I assume are very hard to find, pay a sex worker to apply a little blue makeup and act dead. At the more severe end, maybe getting access to dead people and having sexual interactions, or at the severest end, murdering people to have sex with them when they are dead. Next on our list, sadism. Named after a real historical figure, do you know his name by any chance? He was the Marquis de Sade. He treated the prostitutes and women that he had sexual interactions with who were non-prostitutes in a very sadistic fashion. At a certain point, even though he was royalty, even the royalty drew a line and he was in prison and wrote his fam uh, famous text there, uh, Quills from Prison. So this person enjoys physically punishing and degrading their partners. Next, transvestism. Many students get transsexual mixed up with transvestism. They are very, very different. The transvestite, look at the vest, pay attention to the clothing, vest. This person gets sexually aroused when they dress in the so-called clothing of the opposite sex. So picture a man, since this is almost always a man, who gets aroused when he puts on ladies, say, undergarments. And you're thinking this person, ah, oh, he must be a gay man. Absolutely, positively not. Almost all transvestites are heterosexual males. Often their partner does not know. And I joke with my classes, up to the ladies anyway, if your lingerie is all stretched out, perhaps uh, this person might be in your life. Next, let's consider the term fetishism. Though sometimes fetishism is related to transvestism. Sometimes it's called fetishistic trans transvestism. That's a mouthful. But anyway, what about what is a fetishist? Who is the person with fetishism? He, and I'll say he because he is usually he, he gets aroused by parts of the body that most people don't find sexual, such as hands or feet, or aroused by objects. And students will usually yell out shoes or uh, other objects, and indeed you are right. This person would have to have his female partner wearing typically high heeled stilettos, or quite possibly he does not need a female partner at all. All he needs is the high heeled shoes. I do have two stories that students have shared with me over the years on fetishism. One student said that she wore what she called her tip boots to her work as a bartender. And one day she was offered a very high amount of money, and I don't remember how much, to take her tip boots off and she sold them on the spot and worked the rest of the night barefoot behind the bar. Another woman shared that she was knocked down and she was afraid that she was about to be sexually assaulted when the man merely stole her high heel new stilettos and made off with it. The student was very angry she recounted the story but I think it could have turned in a very different direction. So anyway so two real life stories of fetishism. Next let's consider pedophilia. Many students say ah feet. No that's pod like a podiatrist. Pod is feet. Pet is child. This is the child sexual predator. This person who has any form of sexual interaction with a child or with a minor who is too young to consent. Next one, frauderism. You're probably not familiar with that one. This person grinds up against strangers. In the old days, they used the term, use the term masher. If you watch an old-fashioned movie, the woman's yelling, masher, masher. She has just met a frauderist. Frauders love crowds, for example, crowded subways, crowded trains, crowded buses. And as my students told me, crowded bars. Some of them have had this experience. Now let's consider the masochist. Maybe you've heard the term sadomasochism, perhaps? The masochist is the person who sexually enjoys being punished. They sexually enjoy being degraded. Many people I'll go either way, and they are sadomasochists. Though other people are just sadists, and other people just masochists. Now let's consider exhibitionism. 
look at the root word and see if you can guess the nickname. So exhibit to show what are they showing. So the nickname, the flasher. But my students say it's more common, this is apparently more than a few have met exhibitionists, that this is a man with a car that drives around a lot and gets lost a lot and stops to ask for directions or goes through drive-ins a lot to order food. And the person realizes that the person who is asking the directions or purchasing the food is fully naked and often masturbating. Well, you have just met an exhibitionist. Now let's consider the voyeur. Can you think of the nickname for the voyeur? If you say Peeping Tom, right on target, named after another real life person. If you know the story of Lady Godiva, the people of a village were being oppressed. She won their freedom from oppression by agreeing to ride through the town naked. All the townspeople agreed to stay in and not look, except for one who peeked. His name, can you guess it? Tom. He was a peeping Tom. So this is not a complete list of paraphilias, but probably enough for our course. So it takes some time to learn the paraphilias, and when you think you're not bad at them, give this a try. When you're done, get the answers. Let's see how you did. The masochist, he or she enjoys being punished or degraded. Zoophilia, arousal related to animals. Pedophilia, ped referring to child. This is a person who desires sexual interaction with children or minors that are pre-consent age. Necrophilia, death, aroused by death and dying. Frauderist, the masher, likes to rub up against strangers. Sadist, like in the Marquis de Sade, likes to degrade or punish their sexual partner. Transvestism, uh, vest is an article of clothing. This person gets aroused by dressing in the clothing, particularly the undergarments of the other sex, if we should use that term. Exhibitionist, what are they exhibiting? Ah, this would be the flasher. Fetishists, uh, they're aroused by parts of the body or by objects. And again, parts of the body that most of us don't find sexual. Voyeur, ah, the peeping Tom. How did you do? The previous DSM discussed PTSD in the anxiety disorder chapter. Now PTSD is considered to be a disorder of stress and trauma. I assume that you know what the letters ask or stand for. Uh, they do indeed stand for post-traumatic stress disorder. This mental illness sometimes occurs after a trauma. Many people experience trauma. Not everybody will develop PTSD. I often ask people to ask what types of traumas come to mind first, and usually for most people, it's a soldier in a war situation. And that is a very good example, but I also ask my students to consider the innocent victims of war. They also experience PTSD or consider the people being displaced by, it could be war, it could be a famine or other uh, societal pressures. But think of these people too, when you think of traumas, or if you consider the picture on the bottom, a person displaced by a natural disaster. There are common symptoms. Most people with PTSD are highly distractible very easily distracted. They feel emotionally numb when they think of the event. They often re-experience the event. I ask my students not to think of flashbacks for this as a primary example. Flashbacks do occur, but that is not the typical or even common way to re-experience the event. I ask my students for suggestions. So take a moment and see if you can think of a way of re-experiencing a traumatic event without having a flashback occurring. If you said dreams, absolutely, as well as just constantly thinking about it. Every time that you perhaps was supposed to be attention to your task at work or school, you find your thoughts are on it. Sometimes it will be an environmental trigger. The weather could be like the day of the tornado. The sounds, such as like uh, popping of fireworks, could trigger. So it could be stimuli in the environment. 
or it could be continuously thinking about it. But again, flashbacks are very rare. Let's consider other common symptoms. One is anger. This is not recognized by the DSM, but I strongly suspect it will be in the next one. Some people with PTSD are very angry. Maybe angry at God, maybe angry at chance, angry at circumstance, angry that they survived and maybe a friend did not, but anger is very common. Trouble sleeping is very typical. Guilt, as I referenced before, survivor's guilt. And the person often startles very easily. I often take something and slam it in the class right now while students are taking the notes. And most people jump a little bit, but a person with PTSD jumps significantly. I try to avoid this in classes where somebody has identified to me that they have PTSD, of course. So we've just finished our discussion of anxiety disorders. In App Psych, you would get typically a whole chapter on anxiety disorders. We also mentioned one stress and trauma-related disorder. You'd also get a more lengthy discussion in App Psych about that particular topic. The next topic are the mood disorders. And in typically in Abnormal Psych, you'll get one to two chapters on these family disorders. We're gonna focus on two, that of major depression and bipolar disorder. But again, these are not the only members of this family. Major depression is so common that it's often called the common cold of mental illness. Let's consider symptoms and then we'll consider suicide warning signs. You'll have to go to the next slide though. Let's consider the role of neurotransmitters in major depression. It appears that it is typical that the person would have deficiencies in two particular neurotransmitters. Do you remember the neurotransmitters be associated with mood disorders? Norepinephrine would be one, the other would be serotonin. Most medications uh, used on depression work on both or one or the other one of these two neurotransmitters. Now you might wonder if the neurotransmitters play such a pivotal role, then why don't we just always use medication Oh, why don't we just skip the therapy? Well, the therapy, as it works, actually does alter the neurotransmitters. And to the extent that the person is learning to, uh, to address behavioral issues, environmental issues, often the medications are no longer needed in the future. If the person is just relying on the medications, uh, often the, the beneficial effects of the medications stop when the person takes them. Additionally, uh, some medications have significant side effects. Now these can often be adjusted by adjusting the amount of medication or changing medications, but therapy is usually the best choice rather than medications. Though as a society, we're much more inclined to want to have a pill to address an issue than to talk to somebody to understand the roots of the disorder and to learn behavioral coping strategies. I would consider uh, suggesting that you might consider therapy and uh, a first step could be visiting Mrs. King, our fabulous counselor at SCCC. Let's consider these common symptoms of major depression. A person does not necessarily have to have all of them to have major depression. First one, extreme sadness, extreme hopelessness. Very, very typical. Anger is variable. Some people are very angry, others are not. Next one is very, very typical, loss of interest and withdraw. They withdraw from people. And so they feel less, uh, sorry, they feel worse and they do less and they feel worse and they do less, a vicious circle, lack of energy. So the idea of getting out of bed might be all that they can uh, handle. The idea of uh, taking a shower, brushing your teeth might require more energy than the person can muster. Because of this lack of energy, sometimes the hygiene gets very poor. Maybe a person that was formerly dressed perfectly, uh, maybe her shoes matched her purse if she was a woman, now might not change clothes for days. Again, might not shower for days, might not brush their teeth for days. Lack of hygiene is a common symptom. Change in appetite. I try to keep it vague. Some people eat a lot more, 
some people eat a lot less, though the eating a lot less is more common. Next, let's consider the ability to feel pleasure. It's diminished or even fully lost in depression. Because of this, a major motivator of human behavior has been lost. Often linked to that is the person has no interest in sexuality. Another common change is change in sleep. It could be more or less, but most typically people sleep many hours more a day. And biologically, this is a very bad choice. REM sleep well over the normal limit makes depression worse. So biologically, they're doing something that will actually make their episodes worse than they would have been. Another common feature is loss of self-esteem. Even if they had normally normal healthy self-esteem before, self-esteem plummets. For example, why should I apply for that scholarship? They'll never pick me. Why should I bother doing the paper? I'll never pass it. So loss of self-esteem, very common. And if all goes, of these are present, or even many or most, a person probably will have thoughts of suicide, which is our next topic. We'll now consider the topic of suicide. For some people, this will be a very difficult topic. If this brings up unpleasant memories and associations, you might want to consider reaching out to our in-house counselor, Mrs. King. She's gone virtual over the break, and she is very available to help you with any issue that you might like. I'll guarantee you she is very easy to talk to, very professional, and it will be a very good experience for you if you want to reach out to her. consider our first item. True or false, most suicides occur without warning signs. If you said false, you are incorrect. It is a true statement. So importantly, we should see if we would be able to recognize that warning sign if it was present. So take a moment and list symptoms that might indicate a person suicidal. Don't list just symptoms of depression beyond symptoms of depression. What would make you think that that person might be suicidal. Let's consider some of these warning signs. One warning sign might be any reference to death and dying or any fascination with death and dying. It could be casual reference. It could be, I'll miss doing that with you. And you puzzle and you think, well, we do this every week. It could be a lyric in a poem, I'm sorry, a lyric in a song, a part of a poem, a short story. So reference to death and dying or fascination with the subject is a distinct warning sign. Another sign, the person gives away objects of theirs, especially prized possessions. Another warning sign could be self-injury. Another warning sign could be getting organized and doing a lot of cleaning. Try to think why getting organized could be problematic. So remember, this person probably has low energy, so why are they spending on organizing and cleaning? Well, sometimes they're trying to make it easier for the person who has to clean up their worldly possessions, their apartment, their room, after they die. So this is not a time to be organizing or cleaning. Another warning sign is tying up loose ends, uh, making amends after fights. So pulling together loose strings in relationships, not a good time for this. And the last warning sign can be easily missed even by professionals. Let's say that a person is hospitalized and is very depressed, and they're going to get a weekend pass maybe for Easter or Hanukkah or whatever holiday they might be celebrating. And their mood is much, much improved. And they're released. It's hard to know if they were happy because they were looking forward to seeing their friends and family and pet, or if they were looking for the opportunity to commit suicide. Depression works slowly. Medication works slowly. So if you see a rapid turnaround, rapid from being depressed to feeling good, even elated, either they're not suffering from major depression or perhaps they're contemplating suicide. So just as it's very important to know the symptoms of a heart attack, it's also very important to know the symptoms that one is suicidal. Number two, Suicidal people usually have diagnosable psychological problems. That is true. Can you think of some? Go ahead, think of some. Well, certainly the mood disorders like major depression or bipolar disorder, 
But what about some non-mood disorders? Schizophrenia, for example, is high rate, as well as substance abuse issues. One of the personality disorders we'll talk about has a particularly high risk. So it is very typical that the person would indeed have one or more untreated or insufficiently treated mental disorders. Next, most people who live uh, commit suicide leave a note. But that would be false. It's a fairly small number, 5%, maybe 10%. Think of the reasons why. Lack of energy, uh, in part. Uh, maybe wanting to have people think it's an accident. So that person that gets drunk and hits a tree and dies, many people will think it's an accident. That may not be. A person that gets drunk and goes swimming in a lake and drowns, most people would say accident. Not necessarily. In some states, in order to be listed as a suicide, there must be a note. So that probably jumped out at you that suicides are greatly, greatly underreported in terms of government statistics. The next one, suicide is in the top five causes of death in the U.S. Uh, thank goodness, no, it is number 11, though it depends very much on the age of the person. But next, let's consider number five, the sex. Women attempt suicide more often than men. What did you think? Indeed, it is true, women attempt. The word is attempt. Men have a greater lethality, but women do indeed attempt more often. Let's consider age. Teens and young adults are at the highest risk for suicide. I know you want to say true, but it is false. I know we think of the Romeo and Juliet imagery. Let's consider the person that is the most likely to do it. This person would be male. He would be over 50 and probably well, well over 50. He's newly alone. Now, how do you get to be newly alone at 50? Well, divorce can happen at any age or separation. It could be that the person uh, died. It could be the person has Alzheimer's and is sitting right next to them, but fully unavailable. But men are at higher risk. Uh, also, in terms of other demographics uh, of that particular gentleman, he is likely to have health problems. And related to the loss of that partner, financial problems. When you scroll that all together, that is the person that is at highest risk. Next, after a famous person commits suicide, is there a temporary increase in the suicide rate? Yes, uh, there is. Can you think of the type of learning we learned about in Chapter 5? What type of learning would say, of course, there would be an increase? Was it operant, classical, habituation, uh, trial and error, social learning? Ah, indeed, social learning, when a model is observed and imitated. It doesn't have to be a famous person. It could be a person in the high school that you never even met. Counselors and uh, teachers in high schools and junior high schools know to step up counseling after a suicide because people who are thinking about it now have a role model. Let's now consider about talking or hinting about suicide. If they talk about or hint about it, not cause for worry because if they are serious, they would have attempted it. Hopefully that uh, screams out at you as false. Well, how about the opposite side of coin? If the person's depressed and has not mentioned it, is not hinted about it, then you should not worry. Again, that's false. So basically, if you find yourself worrying that somebody that you know might be suicidal, chances are you are picking up warning signs and you should be worried. But what to do after worry? Let's look at the next question. It is dangerous to ask a depressed person if they're thinking about suicide. False. They're maybe have major depression, but they're not lacking in intelligence. They have schizophrenia, but they're not lacking in intelligence. So if they're that depressed, they are thinking about it. You're not going to give them the idea. It's like parents who will not talk to their kids about drugs or sex because they will give them the idea. Well, guess what? They have the idea. Last one. A college student is less likely to commit suicide than is a similar person not attending college. Well, there's many benefits of college education. One of them is greatly enhanced by several hundred thousand dollars lifetime earning, but is the suicide risk reduction a benefit. I know that college can be very stressful in the best of times, much less the COVID times, but indeed 
people who have attended college are less likely to commit suicide. In part, we know more about mental illness. We know about treatments. We know that help is available. So these questions are important, but also the reasons why these questions are also very important. Now let's consider another mood disorder, that of bipolar disorder. Do you know the older name for it? If you're thinking manic depression, you are correct. And both these names are very frequently and interchangeably used. How common is it? Well, we said major depression was the common cold of mental illness. But what about bipolar disorder? It is actually rare, about 1 or 2% of the general population. What is it? The person has periods of depression, just like we got done discussing a few moments ago, as well as periods of mania, or we can say it periods in which there is a manic state. Hence, the person has manic depression. Now, if you're not familiar with the term mania, as it's used uh, professionally in this context, perfectly fine. But let's fix that. In general, mania is referring to a state that is opposite of depression. So go back to your previous slide, and together let's look at these characteristics of depression and see which ones are the same in mania and which ones are the opposite. And I think you'll be struck by the number that are the opposite. To make your life easier, I might suggest that you go back to your notes on the common symptoms of depression that we listed and then put another column on the other side and put for mania. So let's look at them. Extreme sadness. If a person's manic, are they extremely sad? No, that would be an opposite. It's almost like a euphoria, often almost like a high. Many times people do not want to take their meds because it would take away this very pleasurable feeling. Next one, a hopelessness. That's also typically opposite. Uh, people in the manic phase are often feeling very good. Uh, anger, that one is very variable. Uh, irritation, yes. Um, anger, typically not. So we'll put that in the opposite column. Loss of interest and withdrawal, what do you think? That too would be opposite. Think of the image of the Energizer Bunny. Uh, often uh, interested in many things, interacting with people more, so you might get instead of your four texts a day from the person, you might get eight or nine. You might get a text at four in the morning. So often reaching out and doing much more interaction. We said in major depression, lack of energy, typically the opposite, again, our Energizer Bunny picture. Next one is lack of hygiene. I'm going to skip that one because that is so incredibly variable, so we really can't generalize on that one. Change in appetite. This is one of the few that are the same. Both of these individuals will probably eat very little, but for opposite reasons. The depressed person is too depressed and hopeless and has no appetite. The person in a manic phase is too busy, just like if you just exercise, you're not in the mood to eat. So same behavior, but opposite reason. So I'm going to still put that as a chalk in the uh, opposite column. What do you think about no pleasure? I guess it's time to feed the dog. I'll be back. We said that in major depression, the person loses the ability to feel pleasure. What do you think about the manic phase? Definitely the opposite. Uh, no interest in sex for major depression. What do you think about mania? Often an intense interest in sexuality. So that is often and typically opposite change in sleep. We said to people with major depression typically sleep much more than usual. A person with bipolar disorder in the manic phase would typically sleep much less. They might be quite comfortable with four or five hours a day sleeping when their normal might have been eight or nine or ten. Uh, don't call it insomnia because they are feeling rested. Loss of self-esteem and major depression. Well, in the manic phase, opposite. A person might uh, quit their dream job after college saying that they can do better. How hard is it to be a judge or an a airline pilot? It can be that extreme. Uh, thoughts of suicide? Typically not in the manic phase, but after they leave and go into the depressed phase, yes. So again, another opposite. I would like to put on one last symptom on your list for bipolar disorder, the manic phase. Poor judgment. A person in mania often shows very poor judgment not due to their own fault. So to continue this point, 
a person that does have bipolar disorder needs to try to structure their life as much as possible to protect themselves from a manic phase. And if you have a partner that has bipolar disorder, you need to do the same thing as well. For example, a person in a manic phase might max out an entire checking count and uh, start bouncing checks over town, max out a credit card. So it might be a good idea, if possible, to have the person have a person who signs their checks with them to protect them. Probably only one credit card should be owned, and a low limit on that, which you have in writing, cannot be increased. A person with a manic phase who would never ever have a, a uh, affair in a thousand years could easily, easily have an affair. So an STI check, including HIV, might be highly desirable after each manic phase. If you would never let your child in a car with a drunk person, you should never place your child in a car with a person that has a manic phase going on. So again, uh, both the individual and people that are involved relationship-wise with this individual should definitely protect themselves as much as possible. Let's consider autism spectrum disorders. Previously, we would just refer to the condition as autism, but the DSM-5, the current one, now calls it a spectrum disorder. I like to start by saying it is definitively, according to experimental evidence, not caused by shots. I have the picture of Charlie Sheehan on the right because he's a very uh, staunch uh, anti-vaxxer. So if you take your medical advice from Charlie Sheen, then maybe you should be very suspicious of autism being caused by shots. But if you want to put your faith in experimental evidence, uh, go with the concept that it's not caused by shots. There have been many large scale studies with tens of thousands of children in them. Some, their parents opted not to give shots. Some, their parents opted to give shots. Sorry about that, a colleague was reaching out to me. So if we had a large scale study and we compared the rate of autism in children that were immunized versus children that were not immunized, if it's related to injections, you should see a higher rate in the immunized group. And this is not what research has found in study after study after study. The term Asperger's was used in the previous DSM, but is no longer recognized. Yet many people that are on the spectrum have Asperger's as part of their identity, and I respect this. Uh, the, many are very upset by the removal of the Asperger's term, and I have sympathy, and I would be very irate if I were them also. Think of Asperger's, if we can say it, as being autism light. The person is definitely uh, influenced, and their life is affected by the autism, and yet at a much, much lighter level than people that are fully on the spectrum. Let's look at the defining features. The defining feature is social deficits. A person on the spectrum will have social difficulties in a wide group of areas. For example, body language. You're probably never instructed on body language, but we learn to read it very naturally. A person on the spectrum is often oblivious to body language. They may stand too close. Uh, they might miss signs that you're bored or that you're irritated. Uh, also in terms of social deficits, if you don't particularly like group work, often they struggle with group work. Uh, give and take in conversations, uh, catering your conversation to your audience. These are all things that we often do instinctively, but a person with autism may have great, great trouble with. IQ is not particularly linked to spectrum. A person can be anywhere from zero to genius, so highly variable. A symptom which may or may not be there in a person that is on the mild end of autism would be motor oddities. These might be motions like we call pill rolling. I wish I could show you that right now. Uh, hand flapping, uh, running on the tip of your toes. Uh, rocking is a particularly common one in a severely autistic person. Again, motor oddities are often not found in the, the lightly affected individuals. Another feature that will be there invariably would be need for consistency. I always ask my students right now to think about the big five personality traits. That will be on your next test. Take a moment and think of the ocean mnemonic and see which one addresses 
this particular issue. So let's see, ocean. O is for openness to new experiences. C, was that consciousness or conscientiousness? Hopefully you went with conscientiousness. Uh, e was extroversion dash introversion. Uh, A, agreeableness or aggression? Uh, hopefully you went with agreeableness. And N, hmm, another toughie, neuroticism or narcissism? It would be neuroticism. But which one prefers to need cons to consistency? Hopefully you went with the first one, openness to new experience, that dimension of being highly open to not open at all. They are clearly on the end of that dimension of not being open to new experience at all. So people on the spectrum are creatures of habit. They like tried, true, and familiar. They don't like variations in their routine. They need consistency. Maybe you do too. The most renowned expert on autism is Temple Grandin, who is severely autistic. You'll see a quote from her on a subsequent slide. Unlike people that are severely autistic, Temple Grandin has a PhD, so she can very clearly and eloquently explain what it's like to have severe autism. Another expert is pictured uh, as authoring the books on the left, John Elder Robinson. I originally saw the, the uh, far left book in a bookstore and it caught my eye, you know, clearly being on the topic of autism. So I bought that and find it be a very interesting read. Uh, then I switched to uh, his next book, Raising Cubby. It's about raising his son who uh, is also on the spectrum and his wife, uh, they later found out, uh, is also on the spectrum. Uh, the two adults, uh, John and his wife, found out in, in later life that they're autistic. The book is subtitled uh, regarding high adventures and explosives, and it was a very interesting read. His last book uh, describes an experiment that he participated in using a TMS, transmagnetic uh, cranial stimulation, uh, transcra transcranial magnetic stimulation, and it gave him the ability for the first time ever to fully understand other people's perspectives, and not all for the good. He was able to review the conversations he had through his entire life with a new perspective. People that he thought were friends were making fun of him. Uh, people that were business partners taking advantage of him. So this new ability to recognize people's emotions and internal mental states was a very mixed blessing for him. Many people on the spectrum don't particularly like the phrase on the spectrum. Many prefer the term neurodiverse and I'm certainly very willing to adopt that term for people who prefer it. So let's look at some very famous neurodiverse people. We have Sir Isaac Newton on the left, Thomas Jefferson, despite all the characteristics of autism. Next picture, Bill, Great, who, Bill Gate, who's been uh, discussed as having probable characteristics. Einstein clearly was on the spectrum. Do you know this actress? I find that many of my students don't. She played in uh, Splash, uh, Clan the Cave Bear, uh, many movies. Her name is Daryl Hannah. The actor on the right, uh, yes, the character is Conehead, but who is the actor? Uh, that would be Dan Aykroyd. So just a small sampling of famous neurodiverse people. As I mentioned in a previous slide, by far Temple Grandin is recognized as the most uh, influential expert on autism. I'm not going to read the quote aloud, but read it to yourself. This gives you a picture into how she thinks. Uh, do not necessarily think that all people in autism think in pictures. Uh, this is a subtype of autism. Most uh, do not. Let's reconsider two eating disorders, anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. You'll want to review your lecture notes from previous in the course because I could easily ask a question, but let me ask a very basic one. For which did we associate self-starvation, or vomiting? The answer, I hope you went with both. The anorexic uses various strategies to get herself, or perhaps himself, down to 85% or less of what that person should weigh given their height and body frame. The bulimic would use either one of those behaviors after a binge to compensate 
for the mass of calories he or she has consumed. Let's consider IQ. In order to do the extremes, we have to know what the average is first. Do you know the average IQ? Think for a moment. 75? No, that's actually called borderline, almost intellectually disabled. The most average IQ would be 100. Given an intellectual disability would be the top and bottom 2% of the bell curve. So flip to the next page when you're done listening and write in the cutoff for giftedness and the cutoff for disability. Let's now consider one cause of intellectual disability, that of Down syndrome. Please look at all the captions in blue and fill in as many as you can based on your own knowledge. Now let's recover it starting from the beginning. Down syndrome is also called trisomy 21. Now, SOMI, uh, S O M Y, is rather like SOMA. So basically, you've got three in body, telling you that in the cells of the individual's body, instead of having the typical number of 21st chromosomes, that is a pair, they have tri. They have three number 21 chromosomes. So if they have three, how many chromosomes do they have in each cell? Well, they'd have that one extra, that making the third, so they would have, instead of uh, 46, they would have 47. Its causes, therefore, are reflected in the scientific name, having an extra 21st chromosome, typically in every body cell. Risk factors would be age of mom. Apparently not age of dad. Older dads are far more likely to have autistic spectrum children, though. Let me give you three numbers that might surprise you in terms of how strongly age is related as a risk. Women that are uh, with Down syndrome babies are often older women. At 30, her risk would be very low. About one in a thousand babies would be conceived that have Down syndrome. So one in a thousand at 30, very low risk. At 40, it jumps, jumps very substantially to one in a hundred, give or take. At mid to upper 40s, jumps to 1 in 10 or 1 in 12. So very surprising how age is implicated. Physical traits. Well, body shape. If you're familiar with the individual's body shape, they won't be tall and lean. They'll typically be of shorter stature and much stockier in build. They will also typically have a particular facial uh, profile, very fat, I'm um, sorry, flat face uh, due to extra fat in the body, including the face. The tongue would often protrude out of the mouth or the mouth is often open. Apparently it is not due to the tongue being bigger, but the space inside the jaw being smaller. Health problems. Unfortunately, people with Downs suffer very commonly, very severe health problems. Did you guess any before? Uh, heart problems are not uncommon. Sometimes heart surgery is performed on the baby while it's still in the womb. Other significant health problems include uh, terrible immune systems in the days pre-antibiotics and pre-vaccines uh, for flus that commonly died in childhood or teens. Another common health problem would be Alzheimer's. Uh, they often get Alzheimer's in their 40s and 50s. So those are some of the significant health problems that are common in the Downs population. Uh, psychological traits, well, uh, they are intellectually disabled in terms of intellect, so that's a cognitive aspect of the psychological traits. In terms of emotional uh, constitution, as compared to other people that are intellectually disabled or in population in general, they tend to be as a group uh, happier, uh, affectionate, uh, more cheerful perhaps a partial compensation to the parents. Now let's consider ADHD. Earlier, it was ADD-H. Before that, it was minimal brain dysfunction. Let's look at the key features. There are two key features, 
inattention-related features, and motor-related features. Inattention would include issues relating to lack of ability to pay attention, easily distracted. He doesn't listen when given instructions. Also, highly disorganized, loses and misplaces things because of lack of attention. Motor behavior would include fidgeting, and many times students would say, be told, stop squirming, stop fidgeting. According to research, uh, let them fidget, let them squirm. As long as they're not disrupting others, they will actually process information, or if it's you, you will process information better. Other motor symptoms include being highly talkative, also being highly impulsive. I tell my students, could you give me examples where being impulsive could either be highly embarrassing to the people around them or I'll not write dangerous to that ADHD child. Think about it. So again, behaviors that might be related to impulsiveness that could be either highly embarrassing or dangerous. Related to embarrassing, well, just talking way too loud. Uh, maybe talking impulsively for example, mommy, look at that woman's face. And of course, the parents would be cringing. How about dangerous? Well, if you thought of maybe running into the street after a ball or darting around a car on your bike, definitely, although all children are at risk for this, ADHD children are at much higher risk. But also, perhaps uh, hugging a big dog walking down the street thinking the dog will be receptive, like the child's dog would be. Uh, maybe jumping off of a, something at the playground or jumping out of a branch of a tree, not thinking about what would happen a few seconds later. Or consider this example given to me a few years ago by a student. She lived in a second floor apartment. Her brother looked down to the alley and saw a beanbag chair in the alley. As you think about it, do you really think it was a beanbag chair? If not, what do you think it was? If you said a bag of garbage, you're correct. What did the child do? Open the window and jumped out into the garbage? Yep. And what happened when that child hit what they thought was going to be a beanbag chair? Uh, injured? Yes. More specifically, on glass that was in the garbage bag. So again, that highly impulsive behavior. It also could include maybe jumping into a swimming pool when you don't know how to swim and you don't have your floaties on and there's no adult there. So again, this impulsive behavior can lead a child to repeated visits to an ER, which leads my, me to the next question I usually ask my students, well, what happens when a child is a frequent flyer in an ER? If you're thinking a knock on the door by Department of Social Services, quite probably, and hopefully after a thorough investigation, they'll realize that there was no case here of parents abusing the child, though the other way around, Maybe quite possibly. Next, let's consider the condition known as schizophrenia. Early in the course, we noted that it's perhaps the severest of all adult onset mental issues. How common? One percent. The way I like to look at one percent of the class is a very big little number. Consider one percent of our college our county, our state, our country, the world, this 1% is a very big little number. The cause? Much research has linked schizophrenia to too much of one particular neurotransmitter. Try to remember it. As a hint, it's also the neurotransmitter involved in Parkinson's. If you're saying dopamine, yes, you are correct. Too much dopamine. Severity, again, as we noted, considered to be the severest of all adult onset disorders. Let's look at finding characteristics next. Let's start with hallucinations and distinguish them from delusions. Many students confuse these on tests. What is the difference? Hallucinations are sensory. Think of our sense, sensation, and perception chapter. So they're false sensory experiences. The most common type is hearing hearing things that are not physically present, particularly voices. The voices might be talking to you, or the voices might be talking about you. It is though possible to have hallucinations in other sensory modalities. 
smelling things that are not there, typically not pleasant things like roses or flowers of other types. It might be more like body odors. Other hallucinations can be really any sensory modality. Visual, though, is particularly, particularly uncommon. Let's consider delusions. Delusions are one particular form of thought disturbance. We'll define delusion as an obviously false thought. There are many forms. In abnormal psych, you'll learn the forms and perhaps their names. I'll discuss them now with you, some of them, but you don't need to know of any of the names of the specific types of delusions. Delusions that people are out to get you and harm you. That's paranoia. Delusions that things that happen in the world, all of them directly relate to you. So if the bridge is out, it's because they didn't want you to succeed because they wanted you to be late to work and get fired. Other delusions, that your thoughts are being broadcast from your mind and other people are able to listen to them or read them, or the thoughts are being inserted directly into your mind, or somebody famous is romantically interested in you, and other types as well. So delusions are always obviously false thoughts. But a person with schizophrenia is not only typically hallucinating and delusional, they will almost all ever always have other thought problems as well, such as, for example, uh, jumping from idea to idea. We call it loosely connected thoughts, but they're so loosely connected to not be connected at all. Let me read this short excerpt for you. This is a person interviewing somebody who is actively in a schizophrenic episode. The interviewer asks, have you been nervous or tense lately? The person replies, no, I have a head of lettuce. The interviewer is puzzled and asks for an explanation. The person explains that, well, let us transformation of a dead cougar that suffered a relapse on a lion's toe, and Gloria and Tommy, they're not whales, but are two heads and escaped with herds of vomit. So clearly, just a random jumble of ideas. So even though not connected at all, we would often use the term loosely connected thoughts for their particular thought issue. We would also typically see odd behaviors, and in the video clip, you will see some distinctly odd behaviors. Also typically odd emotions. The emotion that the person displays does not seem to fit the environmental context they're in. For example, a close friend of mine has an adult child that is schizophrenic, and when she watched the 911 news footage on the evening news, he was laughing and laughing. Clearly, his emotions didn't fit the surrounding and the circumstance. Next, please go to the two videos. One will show you the individual that is not being treated successfully at the time of his hospitalization. This is older footage, so I'm hopeful that with the second round of medications that they were able to help successfully help them. The other one, the other clip is a simulation, which will show you what it's like to have an active schizophrenic episode. It's very dramatic, so be prepared. This second clip has two parts. One starts showing a person moving through a typical house on a typical day. That's probably pretty much what you did this morning. So you can feel free to skip through it until you get to the point where you see the window open and the curtains blowing in the breeze and a bright sunlit day. Right after that, it switches and shows you that same person, that same morning from a schizophrenic point of view. I also say on the first clip, if it's helpful, that you can stop watching the first clip after the individual and his mother and doctor all go to sit down on the long rectangular table. If you want to continue watching it, it's fine, but I'll only be asking questions up to the point that you see them sitting down at that table. Let's now consider the personality disorders. There are long-standing maladaptive patterns of three things. Take a moment and see if you can guess. If you said thinking, feeling, and acting, or similar forms of those words, you are indeed correct. But be careful, again, not every time you see three blanks will be thinking, feeling, and acting. It could be id, ego, superego. If it's talking about developmental psychology, the answer would be physical, cognitive, and socio-emotional. 
the difference between our definition of personality and personality disorders is that these patterns and the disorders are maladaptive. In other words, not in your best interests. So non-helpful patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting. Ten are recognized. If you take abnormal psychology, you will learn about all ten. For this course, we'll focus on two, uh, the most researched two, and in many ways, the most dramatic. Let's start with borderline personality disorder first. The key feature of borderline personality disorder is a fundamental lack of stability. You might ask, in what areas? In all areas. The way they think is often dramatic and often changes. There are, for example, political views, there are environmental issues. You would often see a great deal of instability. So in thinking, also in emotions, their emotions would tend to be very erratic. Just because they were in a very good mood when you saw them before class does not at all mean that they'll be in reasonably even a semi-good mood after class. Also, their behaviors are very erratic, often all over the place. One of the key features, though, is that they cannot tolerate being alone. It causes them great stress to the point that they sometimes self-injure, such as cutting behavior or even taking a cigarette to their own flesh. When very stressed out, uh, they can self-injure or even attempt or even successfully complete suicide. This disorder does have a distinctly higher suicide risk than for many other disorders. They also can cause chaos, whether it's your suite in your group project or at your work, they often will create instability. A very different disorder is antisocial personality disorder. Most students think, well, ah, this person is fundamentally shy. They're an extreme introvert. Nothing further could be from the case. What could be the other name of this disorder? If you're a criminal justice, you might be thinking the correct thing. Sociopath. This person is a sociopath. Key feature, lack of morality. No morality whatsoever. Let's do a quick review. Morality, what was our C word, our C term for morality? Conscience. So they have no conscience, no sense of morality. And again, we know the CRJ, CRJ term, criminal justice that is, sociopath. Other common features, this person is a risk taker. Don't dare them to do anything. They probably will. Extreme behaviors are enticing to them. They have no empathy for others. Even if you're a supposed friend, a family member, a child, uh, no empathy. Many people think that they must commit criminal behaviors. Very untrue. They do not necessarily commit crimes. They do not respect others. They do not care about others' emotional states. But they do not necessarily commit crimes. Can you think of any professions that you might actually do better if you didn't have a moral compass. I'll let you think about that. So good legal careers for the sociopath. Sometimes I hear hitmen. No, hitmen is not a legal career. Legal careers might be perhaps the used car salesman. A poor student from SCCC needs a safe car to take her child to daycare, to get to work, to get to school. And our sociopath might happily sell her the lemon of a lot winning the uh, lottery, maybe who sells this lemon. So used car salesman, salesman, perhaps. CEO, who might drive a company into financial ruin. People lose their bankruptcy, their jobs, people lose their homes, and yet often will reward themselves hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars of bonus. Maybe a lawyer. Now, most lawyers have a very highly developed moral and ethical code, but if you didn't have one, Maybe defending people that you actually knew were murderers or, say, child molesters might make your life considerably easier. But again, most people with antisocial personality disorder do not commit crimes. The reverse of that, though, if you look at people in prisons and uh, jails, a great number of them are there because of antisocial personality disorder. Before we leave this chapter, I'd like you to consider that 
A person who seeks mental health help, who seeks a mental health therapist, does not necessarily have a mental illness. Very often they do not. Instead, what brings them to therapy is what we term problems of living. It could be academic. For example, you failed out one college and you've gone to a secondary college and you're failing out this college too due to your behavior. Well, then maybe the therapist can help you adjust your behavior so that you might be more successful. Other times, maybe difficulty within the parent-child relationship. Maybe job difficulties. Maybe you've lost two jobs because of certain behaviors of yours and you're on your way to losing your, your third job and you decide that you need to seek mental health help. It might be bereavement, a loss of a partner, a child, a friend, a great loss in your life that you need help coping with. Or instead of parent-child relationship issues, maybe it's issues in the relationship with your partner. So again, a person does not need a mental disorder in order to benefit from mental health help. Uh, consider as an analogy, if you own a car, invariably the car is going to need a tune-up every now and then to run effectively, and people are very much like cars in this regard. Sometimes we can greatly benefit from a tune-up ourselves.